Hello there, folks. Welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash, and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development, and personal grooming. Now, I've set myself up for an afternoon of entertainment here sat in front of my laptop in the British countryside, because today is an unusual feature for me. It's one of my Am I a Chap series, but instead of taking an image of a gentleman and deconstructing it into its constituent parts to give an observation about the style of that clothing. Today, I am going to do an Am I a Chap watch edition. So something a little bit left of center. And the reason I've done this is because a viewer called Mark contacted me and sent me some images of his wristwatches and asked me for my opinion on these pieces. And because the watches are so diverse and so unusual in their origin and their styling and the period of time uh, over which Mark has collected them, I thought I would share them with you. And, you know, Mark has kindly allowed me to share the images which he has taken. So let us begin way back in Mark's horological journey with his first watch. And here we see a Casio F8. Now, this is a, a Casio which... You know, it bears many similarities to many of these watches which come later on. But the Casio F8 was one of the forerunners of the F91W, which, you know, shares its image. Um, it was around in the late 1970s when the F8 hit the marketplace. And Mark tells me that this watch has something of a resonance for him because it was given to him as a gift by his mother when he joined the Royal Air Force in 1980. Now, he doesn't own the watch anymore, hence this is a library picture. However, the F8 is a really interesting watch in the evolution of Casio on its journey to where it is today. And the F8, quite a simple watch really, as you can see, sort of black resin in appearance. Um, it has a day, date functionality, which is unusually delivered because, you know, little sort of a little digital line underneath the days of the week, which are already set into the, the screen bezel, so to speak. And the date is indicated by a number under the word date. So really simplistic. Um, it has a module 58 within from Casio, keeping its time. And it has no water resistance to speak of as such, unlike many of its successors, which are well known for being particularly rugged when it comes to going in the water. So I think the little F8 has something of a charm to it. Um, there are many instances of these watches still uh, working well right up to the modern day, 40 years and plus since they were first delivered. So a really good starting point for Mark when he ventured out into the world, and I dare say a fabulous watch to take into the military because it's just the sort of piece which you can really subject to a bit of hardship. Now the next watch which Mark has shared with us is something which looks very familiar to me because I've seen many of these over the years. And this was a, uh, a 21st birthday present to Mark. So again, a lot of sentimentality. But additionally, uh, it was the watch which he wore on his wedding day with his late wife. So it has double sentimentality, a 21st birthday present and also at another milestone in his life as well. And what we see here is a classic sort of uh, square looking wash. It's not even rectangular, it's more square. It's got that sort of champagne color to the dial. Um, very simple batten markers as the indices for the hours. And that sort of mock croc um, uh, strap, which gives it a certain appearance. And it's uh, got a, a yellow metal in appearance. So an interesting piece. Um, Mark tells us it still works today after 40 years but is very rarely worn. Rotary is an interesting brand. We often think of them as low-end, cheap, not something many of us would consider, but the Rotary Journey is an interesting one. Um, it's a Swiss brand which was founded in 1895, and it started exporting these Rotary watches to the United Kingdom around that time. Very soon, after they started sending them over in the 1920s to the UK, it became very popular and the UK became the largest market for rotary watches. Now in 1940, Rotary won the, the uh, competition 
to supply the British Army with wristwatches. And as a result, you know, Second World War, 1940, they supplied many, probably hundreds of thousands of watches over the course of the war. And as a consequence, you know, many of these watches found their way back into the civilian world and their brand identity became absolutely solidified amongst the people here in the UK. And when you've owned a watch, which is trustworthy and reliable, you'll tend to go back to that brand in the future if you need another one. And as a consequence, you know, Rotary was firmly ensconced into the horological mindset of this country, the United Kingdom. Now, Rotary is still recognized as a Swiss watch brand. However, not a lot of, not a lot of people know this, Rotary's headquarters is here in the UK. However, they are an entirely wholly Chinese-owned brand. So there is no Swissness, no Britishness in there at all. And they offer a wide range of pieces, from sporty to casual, uh, and even towards the formal end, uh, as well as you know automatic watches and quartz watches. Uh, Mark's watch is actually a quartz piece, so you know it's always going to tick along, it's always going to keep excellent time, but they do make some automatic pieces, pieces some of which... Uh, have, um, I believe it's Myota movements within them, so trustworthy and reliable pieces. And also, um, they also offer, you know, um, a, a whole sort of host of other uh, capabilities on their watches too. So uh, an interesting brand, so to speak, um, but definitely, you know, one which in this instance will certainly tug at the heartstrings for Mark because it is a, a double hitter when it comes to his sentimentality. Today, Rotary watches their prices vary. I mean, from modestly priced for the, the, the quartz ones to in excess of 200 and beyond for their automatic pieces with Myota movements. But lovely to see a watch which clearly means a lot to its owner. <clears throat> okay, let's move on in the timeline because here now, 1993 arrives and Mark has qualified as an accountant. So he decides to buy a watch, which he thinks will be commensurate with the image of a professional person working in that industry. And in 1993, it was an interesting time. You know, it was the, the sort of halcyon days of the conspicuous wealthy world where people tended to display uh, their sort of slightly more garish items than we would probably consider appropriate today. But Mark stayed within the boundaries of conservatism because he went out and bought an Ebel or an Ebel 911 quartz watch. Now this is a 35 millimeter case size watch, so it's classically proportioned for a gentleman. And as you can see, this particular model, which is Mark's, um, has a white dial with uh, Roman numerals as hour markers, as indices, and it is a stainless steel case with accents of yellow gold. So an attractive piece and very interesting. I like it. I can imagine it being worn with a suit in those heady days of the mid 90s. When I was a young fellow myself and trying to cut my own path in life, uh, I would have loved a watch like this. Now, Ebel or Ebel is a Swiss luxury watch company. They were founded in 1911, hence the name of this watch, the 911. And um, the brand in the 1920s became quite successful and expanded globally, particularly into the United States of America territory. They even at one point manufactured watches for Cartier. So they have genuine sort of chops when it comes to watchmaking credibility. Um, they were hoovered up by the vast LVMH empire at one point. They were absorbed into that uh, big brand. However, they were sold off in 2011 and they were purchased by the Movado company uh, for about $62 million. So they're still owned by Movado. They still manufacture these watches and they're still in the sort of, I would describe them as the lower level luxury watch market. Um, now this would have been a very expensive and a very stylish watch in the 1930s. It would have certainly fitted in with the other pieces which were very, very popular at that time. Now, even today, this watch, secondhand, will sell for around about 700 to 1,000 pounds on the uh, pre-owned market. If you were to buy the modern version of this watch, which is still being produced by Ebel today, um, they're around about 2,000 British pounds. So, a good choice, a lovely watch, and one which I reckon you could still wear today. It 
would still look good with a suit, but of course, with its stainless steel casing, it could also be pressed into service in a more dressed down style as well. So a good choice, Mark, and very much indicative of the era from which it was purchased. Okay, now the next watch has probably got the most tragic story behind it, but it's also an absolutely beautiful piece in itself. And it's a Breitling Chronomat. So it's a lovely watch and it dates back to 1994. Now a little bit about Breitling before I tell you the, the sad story of this watch. As you can see, it's a beautiful blue dialed uh, stainless steel cased watch, polished case. And for me, it's got a lot of character, a lot of color. I'm not a huge fan of chronographs personally, but in this model, I can see its beauty with those little sub dials and that striking bright blue dial. Now, Breitling is of course, one of the more famous of all the Swiss watch brands. Its history goes back to 1884 when it was founded in the Swiss uh, province of Grenchen. So a lot of history behind it. Um, it's still based in Switzerland. It's still a watch brand, which is predominantly known for aviation watches. You know, it's got a lot of a, a background in aviation, uh, but also the chronograph, the chronomat, which we see here today, uh, allows you to keep an accurate record of the passing of time. So often they're associated with motorsports and other sports where split second timing is very valuable. What I like about this piece, it's 39 millimeters, right? So it's not a big giant watch. It's a lovely size, even though, you know, it lends itself, it's a sports watch. It lends itself more to the casual, but that size means it's, you know, it's something you can wear perhaps in more uh, circumstances of life. Um, it's a nice size, it's elegant. The chronograph feature gives it some interest as well. So it's got a lot going on and it would have been, you know, certainly a contemporary of the mighty Rolex Daytona. Uh, and it's just a lovely piece. Inside, we will find an ETA movement. So good, reliable model indeed. Uh, however, the story behind it is a bit heart wrenching because Mark tells me that um, he married his wife uh, and his wife was a barrister. So she'd qualified as a barrister, uh, which is a lawyer here in the UK for those who are unfamiliar with the term barrister. I know it's not universally used throughout the world, but a barrister is a lawyer who operates within the Crown Court, so the highest level of law in the UK. It's a, it's a really tough situation to achieve. And you know, it often comes at the end of many years of grinding work in education and the early stages of learning the law. So a great achievement. But Mark uh, decides, uh, along with his wife, that he intends to go on a uh, motorbike tour of France and Germany. So great, one of life's great, you know, uh, touring opportunities, husband and wife, uh, and they decide to do that. Now, of course, um, Mark's wife was not a qualified motorcyclist, so she needed to undertake her test. So she went, did all the lessons, went to the testing centre, passed her bike test and was on her way home when unfortunately she was involved in an accident. And I believe Mark tells me that um, she struck a, um, a manhole cover, you know, a drain cover, which was uh, inappropriately sort of sighted. Uh, she came off the bike and tragically was killed. Uh, and so this is the sort of underpinning story. The reason why the watch comes into that story is that some months later, when Mark was going through things at home, um, he was up in the attic and he found a box and discovered that his wife had been secretly accumulating Christmas presents, you know, and, and sort of hidden them away so that, uh, you know, you wouldn't find them, so that they would be a surprise on the big day. And she had bought this Breitling uh, chronomat for Mark as a Christmas present. So as you can imagine, you know, every time he looks at the watch, he tells me, uh, he reflects with great sadness on that lost part of his life, but with great joy at the times which he and his wife shared together over such a short period of time. And you know what, I mean, you talk about the emotional resonance of a timepiece. I cannot think of a more emotive watch than something in this situation, which would have been bought with love and attention and care by a wife who knew her husband, would love it, would cherish it. And then in her loss, her absence, you know, to find it and discover that she'd bought this wonderful gift, you know, how could anybody look at it and not feel emotional? So um, beautiful watch, a tragic story, but of course the underlying story of love is what, you know, makes us have some some care and some thought in this world that we live in.
Okay, now the next watch, again, has a, a very deep resonance for Mark, because what we see here is a Hamilton Kharki field watch, a titanium automatic. It's a 38 millimeter case, and it's got the black dial. It's a classic khaki watch by Hamilton because you know they've built this amazing reputation for making field watches above everything else and for a good reason because they look great and they perform fantastically and it's a lovely little watch you know it's a great watch 100 meter water resistant and this is a watch which Mark's father bought for him uh, because Mark looked after him nursed him uh, when he was suffering with illnesses towards the end of his life. And this is a watch which dates back to 2019. And the watch was purchased uh, for him and an identical watch for his brother who both looked after uh, their father. And I think, what a lovely watch, you know. And Hamilton, of course, is a brand with a storied history behind it as well. Originally, they were an American watch company. Uh, today, of course, they're owned by the gigantic Swatch Group. So they're one of the many spokes of the wheel which makes up Swatch Group. But uh, Hamilton, originally American, in latter years, um, I think American manufacturing of these watches ended in the 1960s, late 1960s, and now they're all manufactured in Bienne in Switzerland. So they're a true watch brand these days. It, this is a classic field watch, a go anywhere, do anything watch. It's a nice size at 38 millimeters. It's got a solid movement inside it, good automatic movement. You know it's gonna last and look good for many, many years. The movement is good for 80 hours, power reserve, uh, 100 meter water resistance. These retail for about, they're not cheap actually, they're around about 900 pounds today. Uh, and of course they're made of titanium. So they're quite light, utterly impervious to water of any kind. They're tough as heck so you know you're getting a watch which you can do anything in you can go up into the woods and i think their classic looks mean they can be carried across in quite a lot of the casual styles which many men choose to wear today i think it's a lovely piece again another one with a story behind it which means you know every time you look at it you remember dear old dad and what you did for him uh, and i think it's lovely Okay, so we come to our final watch today and we're coming right up to date. A watch which was purchased this year, 2003. And it is the Christopher Ward C63 Sealander. And this is a watch which Mark has literally bought to wear on a daily basis for the rigors of life. He wears it to the office. And of course, it has the advantage of having a GMT movement. So from a travel point of view, it's a great watch to have in the collection. It is a 39 millimeter case size. A really sweet spot, most people would agree, for a case uh, for the size of a watch, particularly when you've got a bezel, and this one has the 24 hour bezel, which goes in hand with that GMT hand as well. Um, and it's a really lovely watch. It's got a white dial, simple baton hour markers with a stainless steel case and bracelet. And you see the most striking feature is that orange GMT hand, which draws your attention to the fact that you're also keeping track of a second time zone. I think this is a classically elegant watch. It has a Salita movement inside, so a solid Swiss movement. And, you know, classic. I've got a, a few Salita movement watches myself. They always keep great time. They're good, uh, good guts to have in your watch. And I think it looks rather splendid. Uh, you know, I think it's got 150 meter water resistance and that Salita movement will give you quite a bit of power reserve. Hang on, 56 hour power reserve as well. These retail for around about a thousand British pounds and they are a British company. Um, the company was founded by three men way back in 2004. And one of those three men was called Christopher Ward, hence the eponymous name of the company. And they've built quite a good reputation. They are quite well thought of today. They were um, at one time, or they claimed to be the first online only luxury watch company. And I think they've got quite a solid foothold in the sort of watch world of the modern era. I've, I, I see more and more of these from time to time. They are a watch which certainly fits the bill for somebody, as Mark says here, who wants to travel a bit, who wants to take a watch, which doesn't have the sentimentality of his other pieces, in case he loses them or something like that. But also, it's a good tool watch. It's something you can wear with a jacket and tie or your swimming trunks. It's got a bit of everything covered. And Mark tells me that 
he indeed does wear this watch snorkeling, general swimming and so on, the GMT function being quite useful. Uh, it's a British watch, but has the advantage of being Swiss manufactured as well. So yeah, good all round piece and a good utility watch. Now, shall we just quickly finish off the story? Because whilst I've told you what Mark has owned and those amazing stories behind them, he's not finished. He's still got some way to go on his horological journey to Nirvana. And he tells me a story that when he was um, a younger man in 1995, he was on an extended holiday in Bermuda, learning to dive, snorkeling, playing golf and so on. And he had a very near miss when he went into a store and saw a Rolex Submariner uh, in steel and gold which was a lot cheaper than they were in the UK at the time. He looked at it, he wasn't sure whether he should buy it. The following day, he went back to his dry, uh, diving instructor and said, oh, I've seen this watch, I see you own one. Um, what do you think, should I have it? And he said, yep, go and buy it, you won't go wrong. He went back to find that that Rolex Submariner had already been sold and he'd missed his opportunity. So he sort of harbored that in his guts all of these years and he's become something of an accomplished diver as he has aged. And he says that even though whilst he wears a dive computer, diving in the modern era, of course you do, um, he also would like to wear a dive watch as a backup. And he's got a short list of a few pieces which he would like to enter into his collection. Now, the first one he's thinking of buying is the classic dive watch. It's the Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean, 600 meters water resistance, available in a 39 and a half millimeter case size. So not one of these gigantic dive watches. Uh, black bezel, a black dial he's interested in. What do I think of that? I don't think you can go wrong. These are the classic dive watch. You know, this is probably more dive watch than even Rolex. Uh, really designed for the depth, 600 meters. You won't go far wrong. They cost about 6,700 British pounds. They are not cheap, but consequently they deliver a fantastic service. And the other option is the Glashuta Original, so CQ, which is one of their more popular watches. It's probably without doubt the most popular Glashuta Original watch. And again, it's a very classic dive watch. 39 and a half meters of water resistance, um, 9,200 British pounds, 200 meters of water resistance, so less capable than the Planet Ocean. But then again, you know, are you really scuba diving under 600 meters? Probably not, or 200 meters. Uh, Glashuta Original, a really beautiful watch, I think, and a brand which has definitely got a lot of interest behind it, founded in 1845, uh, you know, in Germany, and a watch which I think draws my attention a little bit more than the Omega Seamaster, because I could imagine wearing this watch anywhere at any time, whereas I think the Omega Planet Ocean is a little bit too tooly unless you are a semi-professional diver. So very interesting. In addition, Mark's got a few other areas of his life he'd like to cover, a dress watch. And in his mind, he has uh, an Omega Constellation, Paipan, vintage men's watch from 1961. This is the goal. Um, these are quite sought after, very modest size, 34 millimeters, classic men's uh, dry, uh, dress watch. You know, this is what they used to be. Nice examples of this watch can be picked up for around about £2,000 these days on the pre-owned market. And if you get one which looks like this, I think I can't imagine a more beautiful watch. And finally, a daily wearer, which he's looking for. And, well, he's looking for a, a 36mm um, Rolex Explorer 1. A classic little utility watch. I own one myself and this is mine actually and I have to say it's beautiful. You can wear it with a suit, you can wear it with your swimming trunks, 100 meters water resistant, screw down crown. You could almost wear it as that scuba watch really. Um, couldn't go wrong with one of those if you can find one. They're about £6,000 these days. They're quite expensive for what they are, a time only watch, but if you can track one down and put one on your wrist it'll probably see you right for the rest of your life. So there we go. I want to say a really big thank you for Mark for sharing those emotional stories with us about his amazing watch collection. It is wonder beautiful, I would go as far as to say, to see a man's life unfold through the wristwatches he has owned on that journey. And of course, he's still on that journey, so there are more watches to buy in the future. 
I've really enjoyed it. It's been very special. Thank you so much, so much Mark, for sharing with us. You're, you are a chap on the horological front, and I'm sure you are in all elements of your life as well. So there we go. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, you know, don't forget, give us a thumbs up. If you'd like to send me the images of your wristwatches and tell me their story on your life journey, please do so. And I would love to share it with the other gentlemen because we all find inspiration and uplifting elements to life through seeing and hearing these stories. I hope you have. Now, after that thumbs up, click subscribe if you'd like to see more videos. And then you can also support the channel by buying me a coffee or even becoming a patron. I make additional video content for my patrons and uh, you know, a bit of a different dialogue going on over there. And you can find the links to all of that in the show notes below. So until the next time, take care and I'll see you again very soon.